This is an Austrian gasser that was purchased because of its unique puzzle piece characters for its internal parts. The internal parts were put onto this frame that had not been cut, but the parts don't quite fit. We gotta go do a little bit of gunsmith and get this thing in time and see if we can get this old girl running. This is an 1898 example that was made in 1918 at the end of the war. So we're really stretching the concept of interchangeability here. Let's go and see what it's gonna to take to time an oldie but a goodie. Couple of cool things inside this gun while we're looking here. All of the parts fit. Okay, they all fit, but they don't all play well in the sandbox. I've identified a couple of problems with this. Um, the trigger return isn't very crisp. We have a lot of slop on these pins. Um, and the, it, it's, the gun's got some slop in it. And I don't know what we're gonna do about the slop, but we gotta get rid of all the high friction areas first. Um, a couple other things I want to show you. As you pull the loading gate open, you see the loading gate coming open back here? As you pull the loading gate open, and we'll see this later on, this tab rolls in and it pulls the double action dog out of the way. So now you can index the cylinder without snapping the hammer. If you push this back up, then we pick the hammer up. You see right there, that interface, we pick it up. And this thing is all kinds of heavy, which is telling me that we have a lot of drag under here. We have to polish, we have drag. This piece is sliding on this piece. We gotta get rid of that drag. This is a little wonky down here, but I don't think it's killing us. Um, I also noted one other thing that we'll show you here in a minute. The bottom of the trigger uh, don't worry about it. Yeah, there you go. The bottom of the trigger is actually hanging up on the trigger guard. So when you've got this thing at full cock, you can see that the, the nose of the, the trigger rests right there. When you have it at full cock and the trigger guard's on it, you can't pull it. It ties it up. Then there was another issue that we noted with the wood, which is the mainspring is hanging up on the wood. The mainspring is hanging up on this piece of wood that they got. Um, and we'll go through and we'll clear that and then we're going to leave the checkering alone on this one because the gun will look correct when we get done. So we'll show you how to go ahead and spot one of these in if you just happen to have an Austrian Gosser floating around. So I've taken the gun apart now and we're looking at things where things drag and there's this big silver spot right here. That's definitely a drag point and it drags on the inside of the, uh, the hand and the hand part here, again, let me get the light shining on it just right, is up inside this tunnel and there's actually a couple of spots in here that we're gonna wanna stone and bring down smooth. There's also the flat spot on the back side of this spring right there, you see that big shiny spot? That part right there has gotta be stoned. Everything that slides on everything. This is um, uh, uh, what you do when you do a trigger job. We're not changing any angles. We're not doing anything. We're just getting rid of all of the friction. All right. Um, on the hammer, there's a big drag mark right there. We're going to want to polish that drag mark. We're going to make sure the link is smooth. We're going to make sure that everything is free to rotate. This hammer is in actually pretty good shape. And I don't know if you can see it. I'll hold it right here. See the yellow color? And I don't know where our color rendition is right there. That yellowish color and the yellowish color on this hammer, or I'm sorry, on this trigger, all mean that all of this, just like the wear parts on a Luger, were all tempered to a, a very hard, almost a file hardness. We're gonna have to put heat on this trigger in a little bit in order to bend the nose of this thing over to make it fit inside the trigger guard. And we know that because there's a big shiny spot right here where it was touching down. We'll bend that away. We gotta make sure we keep all of this stuff underneath my thumbnails, gotta stay cool. Um, I have three different uh, stones here. A fairly coarse, just a manufactured uh, stone. And then this is one of the, this is an Arkansas stone. These things are getting real hard to find right now because 
the uh, the load for all this uh, all this Arkansas stone got mined out about 30 40 years ago and then this is a synthetic stone out of my um, my old Lansky sharpener but it's a nice fine and we'll check through the grits here and uh, just use a little bit of oil and we'll just check through the grits the oil on a stone is to float all the dirt up out of the pores you're not really lubricating anything you're just checking so all I want to do is just polish that I could have put some sharpie on the back of that so you could see it but it's definitely let's get in the light here right there right there it is so I'm moving that shiny spot backwards a little bit and just taking off we're not taking off a tremendous amount of metal we're only taking off enough metal that the oil here is starting to get a little bit of a, of a, of a metal color to it got it on that side and we'll pick it up on this side I gotta have my finger in front of it I'm pushing down on it with my finger here just to and you can feel it dragging and snicking and popping and you'll get to a point where it doesn't drag and snick and pop anymore and then you know you're done with this grit see that's nice and smooth now and again with the light you can see I got the shininess now going all the way down it's not just on one little spot we'll finish up the other things that we want to do with this stone so we're only working one grit at a time because you don't you don't want to contaminate um, you don't want to contaminate one stone with the grit off another one sounds like Brian's working on that Camaro again outstanding put some ass in it boy we know you got some okay that's good there that's good there now we want to get up inside this and I don't really have a stone here that's small enough to do that I've got this jeweler's file here and a little bit of 800 grit we're just going to wrap this around this file like that and that will allow me access to the bottom of that groove and I don't know how well this is showing up but we're just using the file as a way to back the paper I'm gonna turn this around so I can get my finger on it and we'll just come up inside here and we'll polish it this way um, and okay I'm just making sure the lighting is right here it doesn't take much to actually put a pretty to actually put a pretty good shine on the inside of that we're gonna go a little bit longer it's a difficult show so I'm not even gonna worry about it the trigger has a set of round bosses on it see this boss here and there's another boss on the other side don't take these bosses off you don't want this entire trigger dragging you only want the outside of the bosses rubbing as it rotates right so I'm looking at rub marks back here that shouldn't be here nothing on the other side so we're just going to kind of pull those off a little bit a little bit there and then once again we come back in with the paper backed on something and all we're going to do is shine these up so hang on a minute I'll show you this when I get done with it okay so you see there right there all I did was shine the top of the boss don't move any metal just shine the boss you guys that are tuning flintlocks out there you know what I'm talking about friction is the enemy here you do not have an enormous amount of stored energy to work with so everything that turns the energy of this spring into heat and not into concussion on the primer is your enemy okay and then we'll just keep checking down then through the grades we'll just check down to the finer stone we'll walk on this a little bit and in your last direction you want to polish this all the way always down the long axis if you can get away with it because if you leave longitudinal scratches in this those are weaknesses and you'll snap a spring eventually and um, speaking of longitudinal weaknesses I, I just want to mention something here and I'll mention it again 
A while back when I did the Springfield video, I told you never stick a punch down inside the screw hole of a tumbler and smack it. And the reason why I told you to not do that is because, remember I told you you'd blow the backside off? Now, this is a tumbler off a of Japanese contract Peabody that you will see again here. Don't do this. I just thought I'd throw that in there just because this seemed to be like an appropriate time. Anyway, we're back and we're going to finish polishing everything here. And we're all the way done. We'll be down to the finest grit of stone that we have. And we'll just be mirroring this. You'll notice I'm not putting a tremendous amount of labor in here all I'm doing is polishing all of this down smooth and trying to go down the long the long axis of this here we go so when we're all done this wasn't bad is what I'm trying to tell you this thing wasn't that bad of a basket case it just needed a little bit of tweaking here okay so we got the bosses on both sides of that we got the inside of this with 800 grit we got the back side of this with the really really fine stone right and there's no so point being i have run my fingers over stuff like this before and come up with slices in my thumb don't do that inside the frame on this gun there's not a whole lot of polishing that we need to do because everything's done on a boss but you got a pin here a pin here pin here and a pin in the side plate and the way these are put in and i'm just guessing from context here this is driven down in and then flared over the outside. They just beat it down flat. Let me see here if I can get this light over here. There we go. There's a good shadow of it right there. You can maybe see, there it is right there. That's round and then it was ground smooth. Don't ever knock these pins out unless they're loose and then you gotta tighten them back up again and just suck up the cosmetic issue. All right, the other problem I said we were going to deal with, and we will get there, is this. This trigger is hitting down here. Let me see if I can get that gap through there and show you. The trigger is mechanically touching right here, and it's not allowing this point to allow the hammer to come by. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, let me get that in there. When this thing comes up to a uh, single cock here, it's right in that point right there. It's in cock, right? The problem is the trigger touching the bottom of the trigger guard right there is not allowing us to rotate this back far enough to disengage the single action sear and drop the hammer. So the only way out of this problem right now is to literally disassemble the gun. I tied it up on purpose and what I'll do is come in and knock this loose. See, this thing is in one heck of a bind. Okay, so we'll just pop this off and move on to something else here. There we go. So now that I got it up, what we have to be able to do, we're going to take the bottom of this trigger and we're going to bend it forward a little bit with a little bit of heat and recontour this thing. And you can even see that there's a discontinuity in the curve. This has been hit, whatever. When we compared this trigger guard to the other trigger guard, the other trigger guard was probably made in 1898. This one was made in 1918. The, the, the curvatures are different. And I would rather work the trigger, the part that's obviously been messed up. This whole thing is a spring. And in order to take it out of the gun, this is pulled. Well, let me get the light there. There it is. This is pulled to the rear. I'm sorry, to the front, my boss. This goes forward and comes up. So it's a spring. So this entire thing is a spring. And I don't want to mess with this and have to go back and put this in the muffle furnace and retemper it. No, we're just going to bend this without drawing the temper up here. So we're going to mount this in a set of aluminum blocks and put a little bit of heat on this thing, tap it down, try it, tap it down, try it until it's there. There's no way to really um, measure this. I've mounted the trigger in these aluminum blocks. I'm using aluminum because it'll soak up heat, but also because when I put some force on this vise, it crushed around the bosses. 
So we saw the bosses in the previous scene, those two, two silver deals. All I need to do is bend the nose of this trigger down. And if we cold bend it, we run the risk. We, we run the risk of cracking it. And I don't know, parts for these gossers are just all over the place. You know we're starting to get to the heat because you can start seeing this orange umbra coming off of this. So we're just going to tap it. We'll be in and out of this vice three or four times unless I get lucky. But uh, my karma doesn't support me getting that lucky. So we'll let it get a little hotter here. Okay, I think that's us. I moved it just a little bit, and we can see that the blue line has crept down to here, but the blue line didn't get anywhere near the wear critical surfaces underneath. Maybe this will make it easier. You can see how the blue line creeped down. We're fine down here. It doesn't matter, just as long as we don't get on that heat treated stuff up there. We could reheat treat it, but, but like I've said before, the best way to not screw this up is to, well, not screw it up in the first place. There's a couple of pieces parts on this thing that we need to take apart and show you. So this little knob gizzy here has this tendency to break off. So finding one of these things with, with, the, uh, with this plunger intact is pretty rare. We're gonna leave this alone, but yaha. So we're gonna take this out. All right, and this is captured with a tension spring down here. So in order to get this apart, that pin has got to come out. So I knocked that down, and this is not a really rigid setup, but okay. That pin has a taper to it, and we've got to remember that that pin is tapered. Um, the small ends on the bottom, the big ends on the top. And then all, never just pull your punch out right away. Have everything captured when you pull it out. And then I believe we can get this whole thing here to come out because the other end of this spring is captured down in here. Boy, doesn't that look like a lot of fun to put back together again because that comes out this way, you see. So yeah, we're gonna have to figure out a way and I think it's going to involve tying a wire onto this end of it, sticking that down in there, driving the pin through it, and then pulling this thing out and reinserting. Yeah. Oh, my. That looks like a ton of fun, doesn't it? See that little hook there? Yeah. All right. So we took that apart because I want to clean this little trombone piece, and this doesn't even have its insides in it. But I want to clean this because this has that, really nasty baked on that really nasty baked on goodness there glock all over that and it's bent so you can see it's bent ever so slightly where that part is down we'll go ahead and straighten all that out not a critical um, component but this is one of the few revolvers i've ever seen where the ejector rod actually lines up with the cylinder that you're ejecting unlike all the colts where you got to roll it what a pain in the butt so what I'm gonna do is slide this in and I've made a, like a little gaffer's hook here. That's gonna let me kind of grab the end of that once I get it out. So we'll slide this up in and then looking through the taper is going this way with the pin. So we'll shove that in there until that comes through and then the taper will pick up that spring That will lock down. And then we gotta remember to slide this over it. And then the whole thing is trapped by that little hook there. So I should be able to go in there and grab this and then impale it with this. And then that whole thing is held in by spring tension. So hang on a minute, I'll get my fingers out of the way if you can see it there. And I really needed to grab it coming this way and boop. There it is. So now it's free to move because I actually got all that zuts off the outside of it and we're good to go. Boy, there's a spring I don't want to have to make. 
Yikes. Look at that thing. All right, what is that for? That's for the loading gate. So we'll take the loading gate and insert it through this side of the frame, uh, through the hole there. And the loading gate goes up into position here, and you can see it's inside there. And then this end of this spring tucks up underneath. So let me get that in position here for you and show you. This, when this is in, goes up underneath and captures the loading gate. Okay, and we roll this into position here that way. And then the only piece of this spring that we've got to fight is this little tail right here. It just has to go right up in there. This is a strong spring. You take a screwdriver and put it right in this, this angle here and you rotate this and then you got to push it down. And okay, so I rotated and then I rolled the screwdriver over the top to shove it down inside there. And to give that a good seat, I'm just going to stick my hammer on it like that and pop it down, right? I've covered it before. As long as the force has a place to go, you can hit a hammer with a hammer, or in this case, a punch with a handle on it. Okay, there was a screw that went in right there. What the hell? There it is. There it is. That looks better. See, and then that'll come down, and that's got to lay flat because the hammer's got to roll over the top of it hammer we did all of our smoothing the hammer sits on that spring-loaded firing pin which we didn't feel the need to take out um, it's on a kind of like a bushing type deal right there and it God, I can't even get the light on that thing hang on a minute right there there we go but you don't need a spanner for this because you can push the firing pin down far enough to uh, actually get a regular screwdriver blade across it. I didn't pull that out beyond the sculpt because typically these things are staked and this one is staked on the other side and I don't want to go there. So that's why, okay. So the hammer sits down and then we're feeling for any drag. Kick that up. And I'm actually feeling a little bit of drag on something right there. I'm dragging on something. Am I hitting on the spring? I don't know. Let's find out what the heck that's dragging on. Smooth. Ah, that screw right there is sticking out just a little bit. So we'll run that down that two thirds of a thread that that needs to go. Ah, see now that's flush. And now that we put that on there, all that drag is gone. So you're feeling for that when you're putting these things together, you're checking this stuff out one part at a time so you can isolate it all while you've got it apart right yeah yep there you go okay now the trigger and you have to set the cocking point on this in between the double action and the single action um, sear points that comes up and will cock right there and while it's cocked we're going to push on the hammer a little bit and we're going to see Okay, I've got a lot of force on my thumb right now, and it's not, the hammer's not dropping. So we know it'll stay cocked if the gun gets dropped, and you shouldn't be dropping it, but you know how that kind of thing goes, right? Then um, the hand is in here with the parts that we polished. Okay, the hand sits in there. Not a lot of parts content in this. It's not a very high parts content gun. This slides up in between here and mounts down over this. So as this is being pushed down, it's shoving the hand forward. It's shoving the hand forward because of that bevel. So watch, I'll put a little bit of downward force on this thing. Okay, it's shoving the hand forward, but it's also causing the trigger to rotate. We're doing all that with one end of one screw. And I am feeling a little bit of bind there. No, okay. The thing you got to watch when you're making decisions here about whether or not things are binding or not in this is all of this stuff has to be down flush. So if it's not absolutely flush, you're making decisions based on a lot of um, hoo-hoo. All right. And we'll capture the end of this, except I'm getting ready to trap myself. We needed to put this grip on while we still had access to this screw here. So we're going to take this grip. Take these two wood screws 
drive them in here. And that's the only thing holding the offside grips on this are these two screws. So those will go down. These are not screws that you need to gorilla tight. You bring them down to tight, give them a little snick and be done with it. Okay. Also, if you're working over the edge of the bench like I am, make sure that you swept the floor before you begin. Because if you drop this screw into a pile of sawdust, you're on your own, chumpy. So this end pulls on the toggle here. Let's get the toggle back up underneath it. That end pulls on this toggle. And I'm going to show you something here in a moment. We got to ride up over. Okay. And then we can just ride this up into position. And that pin has to go into that hole. So what we're doing here is we're riding. There's a, let me find it right there. There's a pinhole right there. And we're going to ride the end of this spring into that pinhole. And that's how it's captured. What I want you to notice is look at the distance between the center line of this tumbler axle and where this stirrup is. And watch what happens to the distance as we cock the gun. As we cock the gun, the distance gets shorter, which means the leverage is less and the sear is holding less weight. So in this case, we can let it go. Now we don't, remember I said we don't have everything pushed all the way down, right? So if we're pushing all of this down, this will pop back and I'll show you how to check that in a moment. But the other thing we wanted to see was whether or not any of this trigger work that we did back here, if any of this trigger work actually panned out. And I think so. So hang on a minute here. I'm gonna set this down, bring this up and snap it in. And then we'll see, okay, whether or not if we go to single action, yes. See, now we can drop it because when it's cocked, You've got that little bit of light right down here. You got that little bit of light underneath that trigger and it's just enough to let that drop. Let me get that square to the camera. There it is, you see? And now when we pull it, that light will disappear. Let's see, let's pull it this way. That disappears and it drops. Boom, we're there. Modification successful. And more importantly, you can't see that we did it. The trick is, is you gotta be able to get in and get out with no residual presence. Now, we've got an issue here. This grip doesn't fit on these parts, and why not? Well, I'm thinking that it's binding somewhere, but how do we know where it binds? So what I'm about to do, is kind of like a South Carolina trigger job. A South Carolina trigger job, you just coat the entire inside of this thing in semi-chrome and run it about 300 times, take it out, wash everything off, and that will show you where the shiny spots are. So in this particular case, I'm just going to put inletting compound all over everything that it's touching. And we'll take a look here. And we don't even know if it's touching down here or not. So we're going to go ahead and go in down here too. Roll this on, uh, like right there. Roll that on right there. And then give it a couple of good boinks here with the end of a hammer handle. Okay, we've got dark markings here, right here. We got a dark marking right here, and it looks like the mainspring is in there. It didn't cut in far enough. We've got another dark marking right here. So the dark marks tell me where I need to go ahead and take my chisel and cut these things out. So this right here was where my mark was, and there's a lot of wood on this grip. So I'm just gonna go ahead and take off a lot more because that's right where the rear end of that particular mainspring was. Okay. And then there was the other end of the mainspring which was touching down over here. This is the other spot that marked right here and we're just going to knock a bunch of this off. Take it back to the frame and the gun and take a look. There are other places in here where it dug in. We're going to take a look first. We're going to see if we're making any headway at all. So <clears throat> plug that back in right there. Ooh, damn. Oop, 
See, it went all the way down. Almost. See that gap there? So, we'll stroke it. I don't feel it rubbing anywhere, so we're pretty close. Okay, there I got it to tighten all the way up. Okay. So we'll see if that made it rub at all. So in order to get it off when it's this tight, we just slap the frame a little bit and let it come off. And we're actually, um, I don't see anywhere it's touching. It's not touching. It's just that tight. Maybe there's a little spot right there. I'll clean this up just a bit and we'll, uh, we'll get the grip back on it. Yep, it went right in this time. I didn't do any extra work to it. So the side panel traps this when it rolls shut. So this, I took this screw out right here and uh, we'll be able to um, take that screw, run that home there, right? And uh, put that down. Okay, we didn't need that screwdriver transitioning to this one. Okay, I put that in there. Let me get all that, that all the way down, right? That comes up in, and then we have to take the trigger guard back apart again. This opens up because that surface traps up under here. So that will come down, and then we snap that shut. That locks the side plate shut. Okay, and we're there. And more importantly, we are there. All right. Um, this is actually pretty good. I think we might uh, get the cylinder back in this thing and see what the hell we can do next. Rast on Gosser, Rast and Gasser, or say it any way you want to say it, revolver has a unique grip angle. I'm going to try to figure that out. But we pretty much got it in time, and I think we've got it. To where it should work you got eight let fly brother anyway the other uh, beauty of this now is with the abity system we can just kick a shell and rotate this got to come forward kick one rotate and I can do it without even looking at the gun of course I'm not familiar with the uh, manual of arms on this thing so you know, I'll have to sort that out, but I'm also not carrying this thing. So you know how that works, but it goes bang. And I hope you guys found this a little bit interesting and it's been a pleasure as always.